Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, laser talk. Um, Leonardo Laser Talk is a program of international gatherings that brings together artists, scientists, humanists, and technologists for informal presentations, performances, and conversations with the wider public. The mission of LASER is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of a region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunities for community building over 40 cities worldwide. This laser talk is organized in collaboration with a hybrid lab network platform, uh, which will be introduced later by Professor Laura Beloff. Some uh, instructions for our participants. Um, so we have a hybrid format today, uh, online participants as well as uh, participants in the room in Helsinki. And uh, the event is live streamed and recorded. Online participants are muted and the video will be off during the whole event. Please uh, feel free to use the chat on Zoom to communicate with other attendees or panelists and we will do our best to react. There will be a chance to ask a few questions after each talk as well as at the end of the presentations. For the online participants, if you want your questions to be answered live, please uh, use the question and answer section that you see in the toolbar. The moderator and panelists will be uh, taking questions after the presentations. In case something goes wrong uh, or the connection breaks, we will do our best to fix it as soon as possible. And uh, please participate actively, uh, but we also remind that this talk is a safe uh, space, free from any kind of discrimination or harassment. And we hope that you feel comfortable and enjoy. So uh, the first um, presentation today is Professor Lara Belov, PhD, who is an internationally acclaimed artist and researcher in the cross-section of art, technology and science. Additionally to research, articles and book chapters, the outcome of the research is in the form of experimental art projects that deal with the merger of the technological and biological matter at large. Currently, she is Associate Professor and Head of uh, Doctoral Education in the Department of Art and Media, DAM, Aalto University. Welcome, Laura. Um, thanks, Aurora. And uh, anyway, thank you, all of you coming. That's super nice. And, and I'm a special thank you, of course, for our speakers, whose one is present here, Iona Tsur, and to our online, Josh Bungard and Michael Levin. And um, now I have to do the, the, the duty of uh, introducing a little bit the funders and so on. So, so we're also collecting names, as you notice, and this is a European Commission uh, regulation on, on funding bodies. And um, the hybrid lab network project, I just changed the slide if I, sorry, there it is. Yeah. So this is a um, Erasmus Plus strategic partnership uh, project, and here are the partners. So I just uh, tell you this um, was initiated by the I3S, which is a bioscience uh, research institute from Portugal. Then there's a Vax Society, which uh, represents citizen science. Uh, side of the thing. Then there's an Alma Mater Europea uh, University from Slovenia, which is a uh, humanities um, uh, expertise. And of course, Alto University, where we represent the art expertise. And here I remembered to put the, the, the European Union logo also, which is missing from some of the other aspect. So just very shortly, um, I don't, I'm not going to do a much of an introduction, but I just wanted to say a little bit about the, that in this hybrid lab network project, we actually focused on CRISPR gene editing method quite a lot and developed it. And especially um, we were interested of, can you develop a CRISPR gene editing in vitro? And that means that um, you don't need this kind of science licensing. But could, it, could there be a method where, where one is able to use it in the artistic laboratories and so on? So, so this has been one of the focuses and, and quite a lot, of course, went on, on, on that side. And um, based on that and also the topic of, of today's talk is 
uh, beyond or title is beyond spontaneous generation. So what is spontaneous generation? It, it's a kind of historical theory that um, which understood that life it was emerging spontaneously from non-living matter. So of course this was then proven wrong, but maybe there's a time to look at it again in another way, and, and this is part of the talk. And, and of course this links a um, little bit to the idea of a code. So underneath all this development is a code, and I put it here there. This is a letter to his son uh, by Francis Kirk and James Watson when they kind of um, made the DNA as a code. Now I say made DNA as a code, I think it's usually uh, talked about as discovered as a code. But I think it's not so uh, straightforward that it had to be a code. But um, what, because at that moment when that happened, what also um, happened was that the elementary unit of life became informational. And that's quite interesting. And, and of course, I'm sort of interested in between biology and technology, so, so gene editing and all this is based on code, but so is computation, as we all know. And uh, here's a very uh, short quote from Lily Kay, who, who wrote that about this moment of, of deciphering the DNA as a code, that no longer was biological specificity captured solely within the viscose materiality of biological pattern. Now the transmitted messages were constituted through alphabetical writing as a form of verbal heredity. The new discourse emerged as a pure representation. Now I would like to point here also that this is actually the, the DNA 1950s, 1940s is at the same time when information theories were sort of are developed and having this kind of height. So it, it is a, a peculiar and interesting that, that this also what was pushed to that direction and maybe it was something that it was seen because of other developments. I have very few, of course, I had to put here Conway's Game of, Game of Life, which I think most of you know, which is computational uh, instructions and, and go on go on eternally. Sometimes they die though, but, uh, but uh, as, a, as a sort of a pattern, pattern of living. Um, here are a couple of artworks then. So Conway is of course from the science side. These are from the art side. Eduardo Cox's uh, genesis quite early 1999. This didn't use gene uh, editing uh, such as CRISPR, but it, it is transgenic. So, so there was a DNA again changed to a Morse code and changed to a synthetic DNA and, uh, and that was uh, then pushed into a bacteria. And here's something what we um, also looked with the Hybrid Lab uh, Network project. So Günther Seyfried and Roland van Dierendonk um, were like starting to look into these possibilities of what if the CRISPR editing, could you edit an image? And I think that there's something interesting, especially from the arts where the image making has been so, so um, strong throughout the history. So what does it mean to edit an image with CRISPR and, and like a gene editing? And, and in the next image, actually, you will see this is how it looks like. Looks pretty different compared to the artist uh, studio in the earlier times where you maybe painted certain things with the gestures and here you actually are kind of under the kind of very strict science or laboratory protocols and methods. So here we are creating an image with the CRISPR gene editing. And, and just as a, in the previous image, I just say here the, the bull, the return to Delmon, it's a uh, kind of historical bull image. And what is edited here? So the, the first image is so that, that um, the image is translated to uh, DNA. The lab is making the DNA as a liquid which comes to you, so it's synthesized. Then here in the uh, lower image, the eyes are opened. So that's a tiny CRISPR editing. And, and I can just tell you that this was uh, not the, the first one which succeeded. So there were many mistakes and so on going on. 
and and of course one can always as an artist also ask why bother because it's uh, it's quite uh, laborious however like we will hear today a lot of the science scientific um developments also from earlier times have actually impacted art a lot and maybe this is also something to think about or think about what kind of art is made what kind of artists are we in the in the longer run and uh um, I just put it here because in, in this hybrid lab network project, you can find on the website the protocols and, and they will come more still. The, the project still goes on about half a year. So they will come more protocols with the idea that labs can take them and um, sort of use them. So I was then also looking into what is good about it and what is not so good or what are the challenges. And the good thing is definitely that when, when you do it in vitro, in silico, so it's synthetic DNA and, and everything is just on the petri dish, you don't deal with the living organisms in that sense. So that doesn't require licensing. So, so that makes it possible maybe to learn about it but also to, to kind of look at it and experiment and think with it by making. However, what is uh, quite challenging with that is that it's quite laborious. It's very many steps with the, in the laboratory, what you have to make and take time. And in, in that sense, I would say almost boring a little bit. And, and, uh, but the biggest challenge, I think, is in the pricing. Because you have to send the, 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 the code to be synthesized, it comes back to you. Then you do editing with the kind of liquids and, and with the CRISPR method. And then you send it back to the company and then they, they kind of look, okay, what, what's there now and send it to back to you. So, so the, I think the pricing is the biggest challenge and that also links to the um, the, the size of the image you can have, because if, let's say, each pixel is its own code of color, then, then this, the bigger the image, the more you would need, uh, the longer is DNA and maybe also challenging. Potentially, maybe in the near future, there comes a little bit more quicker and easier sort of our clustered systems in that. But I think those are the challenges. And that's about hybrid lab. If someone is interested, I've just written a paper on this, um, kind of a reporting on this project, but a little bit talking about of guns and, and CRISPR Cas9 in the image editing specifically. So, so yeah. So if someone is, one can Google up or just give me a mail and and uh, and that will be it. And that's actually my own introduction. For the for the hybrid um, lab network project, and now we'll have our first actual actual um, speaker. So, Dr. Iona Tsur, straight from Australia, um, holds two positions: one at Symbiotica, the Center of Excellence in Biological Art. School of Human Sciences, and she is also the chair of the fine arts discipline in the School of Design at the University of Western Australia. She co-established and was visiting professor at Biophilia in Aalto, based, uh, based for biological arts in 2015 and 2020. Um, and uh, so, so she's actually the establisher of the Biophilia Laboratory, so we're very happy to have her here today. And Tour, together with her collaborator, Oron Katz, established the Tissue Culture and Art Project 1996 as a part of their interest in life. More specifically, the shifting relations and perceptions of life in the light of new knowledge and its applications. Often working in collaboration with other artists and scientists, she has developed a body of work that speaks volumes about the need for new cultural articulations of evolving concepts of life. So she is considered one of the pioneers in, in biological arts and has published and exhibited widely in these areas. And then it says here, Tsur's ideas and projects reach beyond the confines of art. 
her work is often cited as inspiration to diverse areas such as new materials, textiles, design, architecture, ethics, fiction and food, but also in the arts, I would add to that. Please welcome. And I need to share my screen. Yes, wait, I need to share. Okay. Is it now yours? I think so. Yes. Let me see if I can share screen. Yep. Here we go. Excellent. And let's make that small. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to be in Helsinki. What? Sorry? Um, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, let me... Um, let me try and reshare it. Okay, share screen. Um, powerful slide. Will that work? Tell me. Does it work now? Try this one then. Okay. Hey! Not uh, that I'm I know much about digital, but it worked. So um, yeah, again, uh, many thanks for Laura uh, for inviting me to present here. And uh, I would like to talk that, uh, I would like to say that I'm going to the cellular level. So for me, life starts in the cellular level. Um, and I think it will be quite, um, well, we should ask what is life, but, in a cellular level, and I think it can be quite uh, interesting in the context of the next speakers. And coming from Australia, I would like to um, say that our project, our artistic project and research was done um, on the, um, the land of the Nunga Wujak people, the tra traditional custodian of this, of Australia. And I wish to acknowledge the strength of, of the continuing culture and offer my respects to elders past, present and uh, emerging. Okay. We are talking about, in the spirit of this um, conference, I would like to talk about um, the origin, the story of origins of our um, artistic projects. And it's the time of the birth of the tissue engineering, engineering and re regenerative medicine. And again, I would like you to understand this history because it will relate also um, for the following talk. Um, and this is the ear mouse uh, that was created or was made, if I, um, you know, partly created by scientists, the Vacanti brothers in 1995. Are you familiar with this mouse? Is it? No, it's the first time you've seen it. Okay, wow. Um, at the time, in 1995, this was um, one of the, you know, most amazing things that people saw on the internet. Yeah. And it's basically done through a, techni to, through a technology that is called tissue engineering. So basically, there's no genetic um, um, manipulation here. Um, I will show you how it's done in a moment. And um, uh, this is... History. I mean, we're talking almost three decades ago, okay? So these are two slides that are taken from uh, the laboratory, the tissue engineering and organ uh, fabrication laboratory at Vacantes, when Oron and myself were research fellows over there. And the idea of tissue engineering and organ fabrication is to create spare organs in vitro, in a dish, in order to then transplant them into bodies. And at the time, um, you can see there are two um, slides here. One is from uh, 1989, 
again, some of you probably weren't born there, but that's another thing, history. The idea of repairing the body was um, through using non-living materials such as plastic, such as metal. If, a body, if an organ of a body stops functioning, let's um, create a cyborg, if you want, by using those um, kind of non-living materials. Then, uh, 10 years later, um, Vacanti came with the idea that actually the body has um, its, own, um, its own regenerative um, abilities. The body is a regenerative site. So you can take cells from a body and grow them. So we can actually take cells and grow new organs. Why use non-living material? And this is the slide that you use. So basically you use this kind of biodegradable material to create um, a, a scaffold of an organ that you want to do, and then you put it in a, a dish and you put some cells. Today we use stem cells, why bother with differentiator cells? But at the time it was, you know, you want to create a heart, take muscle, cardiac cell, etc. And then you have a new organ that you can put into a body. And at the time that was back in 1996, Ron and myself said, why do we need to create organ and then put it in the body. If we can grow, grow something as complex as an organ, maybe we can leave it outside of the body. And I think the next one, next slide will make it uh, even easier. So if we can grow now, if we can grow a heart outside of a body, what is the function? Oops. Someone is listening to me. Oh, what is the fun? <laughs> Is that something that I've done? You see, even um, digital technologies are unpredictable, not just biological ones. Shall I continue? Yeah? Okay, I will continue. Woo! <laughs> so if we can create, if we can actually grow a, a heart outside of a body, what is a heart? A heart is a pump, yeah? Why not grow a pump instead of a heart? A living pump that, you know, we can live outside of a body. And that was kind of a revel for us, it was a new thinking. Why should we actually grow something that looks like an organ or function as an organ? We can grow different kinds of things. We can grow tools. But we were artists and we were very concerned with the idea of what does it mean to use both you know, uh, living bodies as, as a raw material. And we thought that there's need to be a cultural discussion about it first. And we said, instead of actually creating tools, we would like to um, grow art or construct and grow art and grow sculptures. Okay, uh, I have, I put their warning because I might show you, if you are a bit skimish about um, bodies of dead animals, just close your eyes for five minutes, okay? But what happened is that's what happened when we came to the lab to uh, work with uh, tissue culture, tissue engineering. In the morning, we got those um, half heads of rabbits. The rabbits were slaughtered for food for animals. Sorry, I'll move it um, away. And, uh, oops, sorry, this one as well. And um, what, you know, we got those um, dead heads if you want. And here you see myself actually taking cells from the eyes of this dead rabbit. And what happened is that the cells are not dead and over, we keep them outside overnight. And in the morning we grow them into um, three dimensional sculptures. So I talked about the poverty of language because we are looking at living cells that came from a dead body, a body that was dead for more than, you know, for, for overnight. Are those, what kind of life is that? And this is the question we have, uh, that I, we talk about, about the poverty of language. We have one word that we refer to all living things, or, you know, even non-living artificial life. What is this word? It, it's such a complex phenomena, and we use only one word to say that. There's no subtleties. There are no other ways to talk about it. So for us, we said this is not really living. It is, it's a semi-living. And we use the word semi-living, which means actually taking parts, tissues, 
from organisms and growing them in an artificial environment, okay? And here, you know, we have an ear, but again, instead um, of using a mouse as a body, we are using different kinds of techno-scientific bodies. You will see as I talk. So we started by having those, uh, growing those sculptures, they are growing over um, um, glass figurine, and at the time, you, you know, history, we're talking around 19, uh, 1997, no one thought that you can take actually those living um, sculptures, or semi-living sculpture to the gallery. So uh, we created those images, and um, that's what we presented in galleries. Um, it took us, okay. I'll go back to that. Then it took us a um, few years to get invited into um, Ars Electronica, which is a festival that for the first time we could have actually shown living, semi-living sculptures in a gallery. So people like you can come and see life in a gallery, not just a representation. What was the problem? we needed to create a whole laboratory in order to present those kind of sculptures. We needed the whole, the whole um, um, uh, if you want, a theater of, 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 of science in order to create those sculptures. Because what you, what you need to understand that cells taken out of a body cannot need what's called, need a technological support system that we call techno-scientific body which can be anything from um, a Petri dish that inside a, a incubator that imitates bodies to what is called uh, a bioreactor. So this is, you see, we had to create a whole gallery so we can actually uh, maintain those um, living cells. And here they are, the living, um, the semi-worried dolls, semi-living worried dolls growing tiny, tiny inside those I'll have to come here inside those vessels of bioreactor, okay? What happens here is that they get the food that they need. They are in sterile condition because if you expose them to the environment, they'll die. And it's all heated um, to 37 degrees, like our own bodies, and rotating to create this uh, three dimensions aspects of it. So what I'm trying to say here that those kind of, of new entities that we're talking about needs the support mechanism, need their environment, need a new body, which we call techno-scientific body. But they're alive, they're semi-living. Now, people looked at it and they think, oh, they have to believe us that they're alive. How do we make people understand that they have agency, you know, that they are living the way that we understand life? And this is, again, very related to the next talk that you, you will see. How do we associate, uh, what is the thing that makes us um, feel the affinity for other things as they are living? Movement? Automata? Think about those kind of things. So what we try to do back in 2003 is to create um, um, sculpture that can move. And by that, people will realize they are actually living. Uh, we try to, you know, uh, create, if you look at it in a more utilitarian way, well, muscle actuator using muscle cells that you can see here. But for us as artists, it was more about the movement and people relating to this new kind of life, semi-living. It went really bad. And you'll see much better examples of movement of cells, muscle cells, in the next talk. But let's get away from the symbolic ideas. I want to move uh, now into what we call the uh, pseudo-utilitarian uh, semi-living sculpture that we made. And this was back in the year 2000. Okay, another question. How many of you know about in vitro meat? Oh! Oh, okay, that got up, okay. In, so in vitro meat is about tissue engineering again. Now, back in the year 2000, and in vitro meat 
it, for those who don't know, it's the idea that instead of eating the animal, we will take, um, again, cells from the animal and grow them in a techno-scientific body, create the condition that need in order to create this meat. Yeah. How many people ate in vitro meat? Okay. So, uh, the aesthetic of disappointment will come, but that's, that's something else. In the year 2000, um, at Vacanti Lab again, the person who made the ear with the, with the ear mouth, uh, we were two artists, very hungry, um, not much, um, not a lot of funding, and um, a lot of um, muscle cells. At the time, a scientist did a procedure in utero in a, a ship the, to fix um, uh, embryo while it's in its mother uh, womb. And by that, she took some stem cells. And stem cells grow really, really fast. And the whole incubators were filled with, um, you know, um, sheep or yeah, sheep um, stem cells. And she asked us, do something with it because I can't throw it away. And what we thought, oh, you know, we can actually grow steak out of it. And the idea is that this steak, not only that it's, you know, it will come from an animal that was never born. And for us an artist, that was a complex idea. How do you deal with something like that? So we immediately uh, went for the job, and this is the first steak that we grew back in 2000. Then in 2000, and uh, three, we were invited to France to grow the steak and um, in exhibition that we called this embodied cuisine. It was wonderful. We had to stay there for three months to feed ourselves in order to end up in an extreme Nevo cuisine where us together with um, six volunteers tasted for the first time in vitro meat. Um, again, it... Um, I would like to say that this in vitro meat is still using um, animal deriving ingredients um, and it's far from being perfect, but we will go into that. What's nice about it that it sells you a beautiful narrative of being able to eat animals without killing them. We'll go to that. Okay, so uh, how many of you, I, I want to go back to automation, because the more we work with those kind of um, um, technologies, and in general, both uh, biological technologies and digital technologies, we are moving more toward automation for, automation for good and for worse, yeah? And I have here an interesting story. How many of you know how Ford actually came with the idea of the assembly line? to create his, his, uh, mot his uh, motor cars. He went to an arbiter and he saw actually how the systematic way of taking a whole animal and breaking it into parts in order to create the meat, uh, in order to create meat that is then sellable for people to eat. And he realized that he can do the same, but to the other way around. So if we need to break things apart in order to put them together, oh, okay, if we have animal, we break them apart, but it, we can take parts of cars and put them together using assembly line, okay? And that's exactly what he did. And you can see it here uh, using the same, uh, or the, the reverse ideology that started, you know, the idea of automation and assembly line as we know today. So just to make it a bit clearer, if you want, nature, food, but animal is happy. Moving toward Ford, the idea of, you know, automation and assembly line we also add in um, some kind of technology here. But that's still, I see your faces, it's a bit disturbing, yeah? Something is wrong here, yeah. Aha, this is the future. Let's even fragment the animals more into cells. And we create, not only are we creating a real good meat, we engineering 
a natural and innovative process to grow meat for the world. This is a new nature. Yeah? Something doesn't work here. Let's continue. So what we're saying is that the automated techno-scientific bodies are technologies which, which seek um, to mitigate environmental irregularities through various degrees of abstraction. So in order to create automation, you need to get rid of the complexities of a genteel creatures, unruly creatures, and make them into pieces that are, um, you know, predictable and regular. And, um, um, and I'm almost finished here, what's the time? But this is the recent exhibition that we did, which is called, poetically, Sunlight, Soil, and Sheet. This cycle, um, because these are the three things that uh, in the industry of, in the ag tech, in the food production industry, these are the things that all the technologies are trying to get rid of. Because the irregulars, they don't follow a, a predictable patterns and they cannot be automated. So sunlight, soil and sheet are the three elements of our technological utopian future farming. Uh, a technological utopian future farming is trying to live without. AgTech aims to automate and control food production while non-standardized -stand elements such as sunlight, soil, and sheet are removed from in favor of artificial light, substrate, and fertilizer. And you can see here, you know, we try to um, grow plants with no need to sunlight. I mean, there's a lot of sunlight in Australia where I live, but we put them inside so we can control it. Um, we also grew in vitro meat in um, a compost incubator that I'll, I'll talk more about um, in a um, couple of days in another conference. And, um, you know, to um, try to, um, uh, we had also a control room where all the data from all those uh, fragmented life um, put together and we could look at the data and we didn't even, and you know, the data will give us all the information that we wanted to the point that we didn't even had to look at the plants themselves. The data would tell us whether they're thirsty, um, et cetera, need feed, food, also, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to finish with a few slides that hopefully will create a debate, like, or oh, debate, will create a nice, friendly, um, um, yeah, respectful conversation. So um, I have a question, you know, I have an observation, or we have an observation, that human desire for utopian existence, we have this desire, you know, technologically mediated um, utopia in which all our products will be abundant and produced without exploit of resources and their uneasy consequences, because even in vitro meat uses a lot of resources and not coming from non-standardized living agents who possesses the capacity of agency and resistance. Another thing with automation is that we create those machines that do things for us, but what ends up is that we are servicing them. And to the point today that all of us are performing to our automated machine. Just think about that. I mean, I have this bloody thing that makes me uh, perform so it will be happy. Um, and you see here, Ron is part of our uh, exhibition, making fertilizer out of um, um, bodies that have been um, um, yeah, created for food manufacturing. But you, can, you don't waste them, you can actually create fertilizer out of them. But he spent hours just trying to make this machine work. I think, Laura, we talk about maintenance art, and we can talk about that later on. The other question that I have is, can we make life unruly? Can we, you know, the more we cut it and chop it apart into small fragments, will we make, be able to make it standardized in order to automate it and have control over it? 
or what we refer to is there a secular vitalism. There is something about living matter that resists um, control. And this is a contamination that happens a lot when you work with living material. All scientists will tell you it will happen eventually. Life resists. And the last question that, uh, not question, but observation that we want to uh, put is that our psychopathologies of control, all of us, why do we make dry, hard, and digital technologies that we constructed from scratch to become lifelike? We kind of release in control over them. And just think, for example, about artificial intelligence that we have no idea once we press the um, processing button. We let it have its own. While we're taking things that we haven't constructed, we haven't made, and they are very complex, independent, moist, messy, unruly life, and we try to control them. And I think I'll finish with this. Thank you very much. Am I staying for questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, you're staying for questions. So I'm taking the questions from the uh, uh, internet, but uh, there is no question yet. Anybody here? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I always have a question. <laughs> Is it my speech impediment? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just. Um, I was just looking. I, I of course know your works from a long time, and you mentioned just uh, briefly the idea of environment somehow. Mm in that and and a lot of the work is anyway like you say it needs a sterile uh, environment and so on so so and then you have this soil and shit <laughs> thing which is a little bit different so i just want what's your take on the meaning of environment or has it changed also throughout your career yeah. the idea yes okay so um one of the things, you know, I have a, we have a whole talk about actually how a, you have to look, even a DNA or cells, we have to look at it in context of the environment. Yeah, and the environment can be a sterile environment, it can be a constructed technological environment, or it can be soil and sheet environment. But, you, you know, we tend to... Um, forget the environment. So, you know, we talk about, um, uh, uh, we call it, a, you know, um, a genohype or DNA hype or DNA chauvinism even in a way that we tend to look at those kind of things without looking at where they are growing. Yet life, I think there is a context, a, a, a quote there that says that the opposite of life is to be indifferent to the environment around it. So, Everything that I'm talking here, all the cells that grew, they were part of an environment, whether, they, again, it's a constructed environment of technoscientific body or it's in um, soils and sheet. What I can tell you that sheet and soil is a much more complex environment than um, the Petri dish or the, you know, the, the bioreactor that you, you saw over there. Another thing that I can tell you that these kind of cells have evolved over many, many years to um, develop in those kind of environment. And once we transfer them to a new artificial environment, they behave very, very differently. Um, and uh, those environments are, are very complicated, are very limited in the sense of um, if you want, you know, they are closed system. They're not evolving as such. M what will happen that most of the in vitro um, environment will eventually um, get contaminated and then the um, scientists usually get rid of them. I don't know what happened when you have a whole bioreactor with one bacteria coming in. It's a big problem and then you have to put antibiotics. Um, again, the, the other things that I'm asking, 
you take already an organism that is so complex in such a complex environment, and of course you can take bits and try to sustain them for some time in an um, um, artificial environment, but then it's very hard to take them out of that environment. So they are dependent on that environment. But you can say that we all, in a way, already living in a techno-scientific environment, techno-scientific body, that if we'll be left, I don't know about you, but I can tell about myself, if I'll be left suddenly, you know, in the bush or here in the forest, um, without my technological support mechanisms, I, am, I still have a chance to live, but I'm not sure uh, how long. But if you'll transport me to space without my technological support mechanism, I will not survive. And that's what happens when you take cells from a body and put them in vitro. You kind of transfer them into space. Make sense? Yeah? No problem. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <gasps> Uh, you mentioned about um, animal resources that you're, s you're using for the in vitro meat, but have you taken any other approaches like pluripotent cells or things like that? So, um, listen, th th you, can <laughs> you can order cells online. There is, if you, yeah, you can go and um, order cells online. So they come in a very abstract forms, you know, in a little vial. So it's not bloody. It's that you don't see all the soil shit and all that, you see. But these cells still came from somewhere. Yeah. Cells don't come. We, we talked about the fact that cells, I think the whole idea is now that life comes from life. Yeah, it's not coming from non-living. So they still come from some sorts of life. Um, so there was an animal there somewhere. Yeah, that, um, well, in the scientific term, we'll say sacrifice her life uh, for you. I don't know if willingly or not. But um, again, we also have, uh, we, scientists in, uh, also created this technology of immortal cells, immortal cell line. So you can make those cells to basically divide forever, um, which is basically what cancer is all about. Um, so, um, that's, you know, uh, you still need those kind of life. Now, another thing that you have with in vitro meat is that muscle cells especially do thrive much better on um, serum which is coming from animal blood. I think that there's a lot of research to try and uh, create a ser artificial serum again that you don't need to rely on um, blood of animals. Again, this is all in the way to this kind of um, technologically mediated utopia that we will have this meat that we desire so much without the consequences that involve with that, without the resources. I mean, what do you think? In the lab, we're using so many resources, so much plasticware is being thrown out. The lights, everything, it's, you know, sometimes as an artist, I feel that it's really important to get people into the lab to understand it's not a magical place. It's a place that a lot of waste is happening, a lot of boredom and a lot of failures as well. So again, it's part of this idea of, um, of creating this utopia, which, you know, another solution is just to consume less meat. But that's not something that, yeah, many people are happy about, definitely not businesses. Yeah. So there is a question uh, in the chat. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you uh, so much for your fascinating talk. Um, what do you think about the possible future protein substitutes from microbial organisms, uh, for instance, yeast, in relation to artificial meat uh, projects? Products. Um. Yeast, yeah, come on, beer. I'm saying all uh, yeast is, is one of the, the, you know, of course we can use it. I, I, I don't really understand what is the, the question. I mean, many people decide to um, go to plant-based um, 
diet, and that's fine. Um, is the question... <laughs> Sorry. Substitute, yeah. Yeah, from microbial organisms. Um, uh, yeah, it's really funny because, you know, all those questions is how can we create more technologies to create more food? I mean, we have food. <laughs> you know, that's the interesting thing about humans. And, and I'm, I'm part of it. I mean, I'm, I'm implicated. I'm in the lab. And for me, it was important f uh, for you to see that... Yeah, I took the cells from this animal. You know, I'm implicated in all those kind of things. Um, but again, you see us psychopathology? Um, can we, we're now looking for more technologies to create food that will be more sustainable or, or you know, but through technological approach. Approach it, it, it's, it's, you know, um, we have a problem of this, distribution of food, we have many of the, but humans knew how to feed themselves for a very long time. That's not a problem. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to have you here and I'm after your uh, 30 years, at least, of experimenting um, with these issues, I'm wondering, ethically, where, what has been your evolution? Because um, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not an easy task. And as you say, you are um, kind of uh, curious as an mm -hmm, artist. Mm -hmm. And you really want to, to kind of put certain issues out there. Yeah. But how... How are you now? Yeah. And I think that these psychopathologies of control uh, is a good probably yeah. beginning. So um, I'm a human. I'm not a machine. So I'm irrational and not efficient and contradictory and unruly. Um, OK, when we started back in 1996, we came with this kind of, um, um, you know, I think naivety, which is lovely, uh, yeah, sometimes you miss this naivety, that um, through, you know, through those kind of technology, we can really create a better world. Oron, my partner, he came from a product design perspective, and he, you know, the, the thesis that he wrote is about growing, constructing objects or, or you know, um, if you want, even he talked about a chair that is tissue engineered, that in a way um, it will be sustainable and also will have more kind of uh, emotional connection to it, like, like you know, kind of a, a guard, a, a, a pet or, or a plant. So we won't throw it away, you know. Um, of course, this is not possible uh, technically. Also, you know, with all good intention, imagine this chair then give you all sorts of other diseases, etc. So there's always, you know, technology is not good or bad. Technology can go to many um, places. But the more we were in, and, and I think the fascination, there is a really strong fascination with, you know, what is life? I mean, we are life. What is life? And I believe that the next speakers, you know, also a lot of their fascination is to understand uh, what is life. And um, there is something really uneasy, but also quite uh, interesting, working with living material and, and, you know, and, and facing all the failures, that the more you try to make it do what you want, it will resist, yeah? And at the beginning you are frustrated, then you say, oh, this is the, you know, the, the, the whole thing. Um, so we went from this naivety to a more kind of, um, I would say, a, a realization that, um, well, I don't want to say that the world is fucked, but let's put it this way, because also not so much with what is happening in the lab. Okay. Oh, I have a better answer. It was brewing there. So we did, uh, you know, victimless led there and um, victimless stake. 
as a critique, as, as a joke, if you want, you know, and a victim has leather died spectacularly at the MoMA, you know, it didn't work. And we said, yeah, this is exactly what we want to show, you know, that technology not always working. The stake, the in vitro stake that we created, that we uh, grew, people threw out. And we said, this is lovely. We don't have to swallow every technology that is being given to us. And then, a decade, two decades later, it's, you know, companies are, are doing that and coming with those fantasies and completely not uh, critical about it. And suddenly you realize that, you know, uh, maybe the role, now we're more thinking about what is the role of the artist and the critical artist. Um, and what can we do in order to still be in the lab and be among our, you know, colleagues, artists, scientists, etc., but be able to um, get those, those complexities and those psycho, um, pathologies outside and um, make people understand when they look at those um, websites of all the um, of companies that promise those kind of to technological utopian to be a bit more savvy and a bit more um, cautious and, and understand that a lot of it is pure fantasy. Yeah. Thanks. No burning questions, huh? No. So then. Okay. There's a wish for five minute break. And then we go to another, so go to the toilet if you have to, or whatever, have a, have a chat with your neighbor. All right, I think we're gonna continue. Um, some people are still running around here, but uh, I think that doesn't matter. So, our next speaker uh, couple here, Joseph Bongard and Michael Levin. And uh, they are online, as we see them already there. Uh, Josh Bongart is a Vinot uh, prof excuse me if I'm pronouncing wrong stuff. So, Vinot maybe, professor of computer science at the University of Vermont and director of the Morphology, Evolution and Cognition Laboratory, which sounds to me yeah, absolutely fantastic. His work involves soft, evolved, and crowdsourced robots, as well as computer-designed organisms. He is a co-author of the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, the instructor of a Reddit-based evolutionary robotics MOOC, and director of the robotics outreach program, Twitch Blaze Robotics. And then Michael, Michael Levin is a one of our Bush Distinguished Professor of Biology and Director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts University. His work involves using developmental biophysics and computer science to understand the action of cell groups as a collective intelligence. Applications of his lab's work have extended to the repair of birth defects, induction of regeneration, cancer reprogramming, and the creation of novel synthetic living protoorganisms. And I want to welcome both of them and the title of the talk, which is, will be um, on Xenobots, is The Innate Creativity of AI and of Life. So please welcome. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, my, uh, my name is Josh Bongard, and thanks for inviting uh, myself and Mike Levin. Uh, we've decided to tag team this, this uh, discussion, so I'll start off, and then uh, in about 15 minutes from now, I'll hand over the baton to, uh, to Mike. Um, so again, thanks to Laura, and thanks to the organizers for this event, and thanks to all of you for attending this evening. Um, my apologies that I couldn't be there in person. Um, as Laura mentioned, I wanted to start by talking about the innate creativity of uh, AI in particular. Uh, I'm an AI researcher, a computer scientist, and a roboticist. So uh, as Ionat uh, just pointed out in the previous uh, talk, there are sort of three players at work in, uh, at the intersection of art and technology. Uh, there are us humans that create things, there is technology, the created uh, thing, and there is 
a life. And, and it seems that that's the theme this evening is the interactions or the changing ways in which humans and living systems and technology interact. So I want to focus in, uh, in the, on these 15 minutes on the AI side and just give you a sense of uh, what AI is currently capable of, what it's currently not capable of, and what it may be capable of uh, in the years to come. And I think, again, that addresses an important point that the previous speaker just made, is trying to separate uh, the hype from reality and, and really think through collectively as a society where we want to go with art and technology. So uh, to start my part of the talk, uh, I thought I'd start with libraries. I know you are all physically present uh, in a physical library. This is another physical library, the Trinity College uh, in Dublin. But I wanted to talk actually about uh, an imaginary library, the uh, Library of Babel. Uh, some of you may know that term. Uh, it's the title of a short story by the Argentinian short story writer uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, and like many of his short stories, the Library of Babel was kind of a thought experiment. He invites the reader to imagine uh, a library um, stocked not just with um, all of the books that have currently been written, but all of the books that could possibly be written, the space of all possible books. As you can imagine, this is a very large uh, library. And so this idea of all possible books or all possible things that humans and now humans and AI might create together is what I want to try and focus on. I think that's one thing that uh, artists and scientists and engineers share is an attempt to leave behind the known and the obvious and push as far as we can out into uh, what's possible, the space of possible things possible uh, ideas. Uh, he, engineers, scientists, and AI and artists all try and push into the space of the possible in different uh, ways. So uh, I want to try and focus or structure our thoughts about uh, the space of the possible by using this metaphor created by Borges of uh, the Library of Babel. Um, there are many possible uh, libraries of Babel. Um, here's a pretty small one. Uh, I want you to imagine a library that contains all books that are one English character long. And we'll just assume lowercase letters to start with. It's a pretty small library. There's only 26 uh, books in it. You can imagine another library of Babel, which contains all possible books that are two characters long. Um, it's still pretty small, but it's growing pretty quickly. Um, one, of the, one of the ways of approaching these spaces of the possible as a, as a mathematician or a computer scientist is we can actually enumerate or count all the possible things in that space. In this Library of Babel, there are 676 possible uh, books. You can go to the website called Library of Babel, and uh, that website, can, quote unquote, contains all books that are 410 pages long. Every page contains, uh, contains 40 rows, and each row contains 80 characters, as you see here. If you imagine this, the Library of Babel that corresponds to this possible set of all possible books, it is a very, very large uh, space. And as you can immediately see, if you start to visit random pages in this website, that the vast, vast majority of books in any library of Babel are uh, nonsense. They're not interesting. They're not creative. They're not engaging. Um, they're not of interest to humans in any way. So the job of the artist and the job of, job of a scientist or the job of the AI is to move through the space of the possible and ignore the 99.999% of the junk or uninteresting stuff that's out there and liberate and find and bring back for other humans to consider those, uh, what you call in English, the needle in the haystack, the very, very rare exemplars of interesting things. In this particular library of Babel, here's another book that exists in that library, which is the first 410 pages of uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Another book that exists in this library is this one, and I will uh, alternate back and forth between these two slides. Hopefully you can see what separates these two books in the library of Babel, which is a difference in a single character. 
And what's important about that is when we think about the space of all possible things, if we can quantify or enumerate them, we can also measure the distance between any two items in that library. In this case, there is a very small distance between these two books and a very large distance between these two books. Okay. So uh, again, thinking about these libraries, um, uh, it, is diff it is difficult or impossible for the human imagination to grasp how big these libraries or these spaces of the possible actually is. In the case of this particular library, you can actually write down the number of how many books there are. There are 28 to the 80 times 40 times 410 books in this library. For comparison, there are 10 to the 28 uh, atoms in the known universe, which is a vanishingly small number in comparison. What I'm going to show you in a moment is how Mike and I designed an AI to search the space of all possible uh, organisms, which is similarly a large space. How can we possibly task technology, in this case AI, with exploring these vast spaces and bringing back the very, very small examples of things that are interesting? So uh, we'll leave books behind now and move on to uh, life or living systems. Um, you, most of you have probably seen this image before, a version of it. This is a way to try and uh, represent the relationships between most or all uh, living systems uh, on the planet. Uh, all species that currently exist on the shell of this tree or on the twigs of this tree. And as we move, move inward towards the root, we're exploring uh, all possible, all organisms uh, that have previously existed. And of course, this space or library itself is already huge, but again, it is the space of only those organisms that do exist or have existed. If we again combine this metaphor of the Library of Babel with all existing and uh, or all existing species and those that have existed, it turns out that if you represent each species as a point in a mathematical space, it is a very sparsely populated space. These are islands uh, in, in this vast space. And the vast majority of all possible organisms, organisms that could exist and survive on this planet, have not yet been explored uh, by Mother Nature. So the project uh, that Mike and I uh, are working on and have worked on now for a few years, which I'll introduce you to in a moment, instead of us tinkering manually with living systems to see what we can make, we're gonna turn over the task of, nav of navigating through the space of all possible living systems to an AI. And we're gonna give that AI instructions about how we want it to move through that space. Um, as the years progress and AI improves uh, and, and biofabrication facilities improve, it's going to get easier and easier for AI to find more and more interesting exemplars of living systems that have form and function different from any that have existed on Earth before. And perhaps in the Q&A session, we can talk about the implications uh, of that. Uh, so uh, two years uh, ago now, uh, Mike and I and our two colleagues, uh, Sam Kriegman and Doug Blackiston, reported the very first example of an AI-generated uh, organism. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that uh, organism was made. Uh, at that time, uh, Mike and Doug uh, explained to us that uh, they can rearrange living tissue taken from a particular frog. This is Xenopus uh, lavis. Um, Doug Blackiston is a microsurgeon. He's very talented at rearranging living tissue under the microscope. Uh, at that time, Doug informed us that he could work with frog uh, skin stem cells and frog heart muscle cells or tissue that you see here. And as uh, AI researchers, we then took those two cell types and we viewed them as a type of Lego brick, two different kinds of Lego bricks or building blocks that could be used by the AI designer or the AI artist. The AI was free to try and combine these two parts together in arbitrary ways to explore the library of Babel of all possible tissue rearrangements of frog skin and frog heart muscle tissue. What you're gonna see in this video is uh, the AI's first attempt to put these pieces together. Uh, you'll notice that it's building them up using, uh, it's us using these very small building blocks again, where now we have the blue cubes represent skin tissue. There, you can notice, in, especially in the top panel, that these cubes are being pulled and pushed 
passively by the red-green voxels. The red-green voxels are meant to represent heart muscle tissue, which will increase and decrease uh, in volume. And the previous speaker just talked about hearts and pumps, which is perfect. Um, if you put frog heart tissue together in the shape of a frog heart, those cells will talk to one another and figure out how to, uh, to synchronize and push blood out of the heart and expand to pull blood into the heart. Doug told us that if you rearrange heart muscle tissue, Doug wasn't sure about the resulting biology. Would those heart cells synchronize or not? Since we don't know, we made things hard on the AI. We told the AI basically that these things wouldn't synchronize. So we've actually made the job uh, very difficult for the AI, which is to try and build a living machine that does something out of unreliable parts, or at least parts that don't synchronize. I mentioned that we asked the AI to build a machine for us. So there's two things that we supply to this AI. We describe the building blocks to it, which I've already told you about. Then we tell the AI what we want. We want it to make a machine that does something useful for human beings. In this very first experiment, um, the task that the, these machines should perform is very simple, which is to move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. The computer starts by creating 100 random machines. Here you see three of those 100 machines. The AI goes through and watches each of these 100 simulated machines, and it deletes the ones that do a poor job at whatever we want these machines to do, which in this case is move from left to right. And it makes randomly modified copies of the surviving machines that happen to move a little bit further to the right. And if you repeat this process over and over again, in this particular experiment, we got the following machine, which you'll notice it's got unreliable parts, but it is reliably moving in a more or less straight line from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. I've described the AI to you, which is basically an algorithm written in code, and it, you probably have guessed what kind of algorithm this is. This is an evolutionary algorithm. Like nature, it is uh, performing a trial and error process where it deletes poorly performing machines or systems and makes randomly modified copies of surviving systems. And evolution either outside the computer or inside the computer is extremely powerful and very creative. It can come up with non-obvious solutions like the one that you see here. It can overcome difficulties and constraints like trying to build a reliable machine out of semi-reliable uh, parts. This is just the first part of this first experiment. Um, as you can see here, this is all virtual. Uh, it all took place inside a supercomputer here in uh, Vermont in the Northeastern uh, United States. At the end of this two week period, the supercomputer spat out this particular design. We sent it to uh, Mike and Doug uh, at Tufts. And we're now gonna look down through the microscope we're going to look down through the microscope uh, with Doug, our microsurgeon, who's going to reach in with microsurgical tools. He has liberated skin and heart muscle tissue from embryonic uh, frogs and re, uh, re aggregated those cells into a ball of cells. And he is now gradually scraping away or sculpting a shape to match the blue, the AI generated uh, blueprint. Lots of interesting aspects to how Doug actually builds this AI design blueprint. I don't have time to talk about that uh, today. At the end of this microsurgical procedure, uh, Doug takes that upside down Xenobots and puts it right side up uh, on the bottom of a Petri dish. And what you get is a, Xeno, a physical Xenobot, Xeno for Xenopus Lavis and Bot for Robot that reliably walks along the bottom of the Petri dish in the way that the AI predicted that it would. And this is arguably the world's first computer designed uh, organism. Um, since that time, we've moved on from walking uh, xenobots to uh, swimming xenobots. This was uh, reported in the literature last year. This is a xenobot that's using very small hairs on its outer surface called cilia that it uses to beat against the liquid medium and uh, uh, propel itself through room temperature fresh water. And then at the end of uh, last year, we introduced the third paper in this series so far. What you're watching is a swimming xenobot, this large dark mass here. If you sprinkle the Petri dish with dissociated uh, frog skin cells, 
this particularly shaped xenobot will end up pushing those cells together into a mass. Those cells are sticky. They will end up sticking to one another. And after a, a few hours, they will, if this pile is large enough, they will grow these small cilia, these small hairs on their outer surface. And left to its own devices, this pile will eventually start moving on its own. If you sprinkle fresh cells into the dish, it will make another pile which continues moving and you have a parent xenobot making a child xenobot making a grandchild xenobot and you have self replicating xenobots. That's just a taste, I think, of the creative potential of AI of what's currently possible and what's to come and uh, I will now turn over the floor to Mike to continue the uh, conversation. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, that's a, uh, an excellent introduction. Um, all the key uh, kind of uh, topics are covered. So what I'm going to do is uh, bring in some biology. And thank you, um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share some uh, some thoughts with you. Um, you can you can uh, reach um, reach me here if you have questions later on. Um, this uh, this of course uh, is Alan Turing. Uh, everybody knows that uh, he was uh, kind of one of the forefathers of thinking about intelligence, creativity, uh, these kinds of things in novel uh, embodiments. So, so not uh, human, but other kinds of embodiments. But one of the things that uh, is perhaps less known is that he was also interested in morphogenesis, um, the generation of shape, the spontaneous generation of, of shape in living, uh, living tissues. And uh, it's kind of interesting to think about why the same person would be interested in these two topics. And I think he saw very clearly that there's a, a truly fundamental connection. And the connection is that we are all uh, collective intelligence is made of cells. This is, uh, this is one cell here. It has no brain, it has no nervous system. It's called a lacrimaria. Um, you can see the amazing uh, competency that it has at handling its own local, uh, local goals, morphological, um, physiological, and so on. And the remarkable thing about, is that all of us make the journey from something that some people call just physics, so an unfertilized oocyte, which is just basically a collection of, of uh, inert chemicals. And then uh, that, there's, a, there's a remarkable process of embryogenesis in which individual cells, uh, precursors of things like this, work together on very large scale goals. So, so building a, um, a complex organ like this, or perhaps a human that's going to then have human level cognition, um, uh, second order kinds of thoughts about what it is and, and why it is or isn't a machine and those kinds of things. So we all take this journey from, from, a, from a bag of inert chemicals uh, to a, a highly sentient complex organism. And so so that, that process that converts physics into mind is, is one of the most you know, beautiful and, and mysterious things in, in science. And uh, the, uh, the amazing thing about embryonic development is that it shows intelligence long before it creates an actual animal that can show behavioral intelligence. And let me, let me share with you some, some examples of this. Uh, development, of course, is extremely reliable. So, so with, with very few exceptions, eggs give rise to whatever it is that they're supposed to give rise to. But um, we, can, we can notice some interesting things. First of all, you can take a, an early embryo of many species, including humans, uh, cut it in half, and what you get are not two half embryos, which is what would happen if you cut any of our kind of uh, technology in half, but you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And this is because each side will realize that the other side is missing and restore everything that it needs and you get two perfectly normal human bodies. And so development has this, uh, and, and, and morphogenesis in general has this ability to get to a goal state in some particular space, which, which Josh just introduced, uh, from a variety of starting conditions despite a variety of perturbations along the way, various local, local minima that might be um, uh, trying to uh, uh, sort of trap that process. Here's, here's another example. This is something that we discovered. These are, these are tadpoles of the frog Xenopus lavis. Here's a brain, here are the eyes, here are the nostrils, this is the gut. And these tadpoles reliably turn into frogs. So all the craniofacial features have to move and rearrange. So the eyes have to move forward, the jaws have to move and so on. Well, it turns out that this is not a hardwired process because if you make these, uh, what we call Picasso tadpoles, so basically you put the organs in the wrong place. So the eyes on the back of the head, the mouth is off to the side, everything is scrambled. They still make uh, quite normal frogs because all of these pieces will go in novel uh, uh, paths relative to each other. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they have to come back to give you the correct uh, proper frog face and then they stop. So what the genetics actually specifies is a system that can minimize error and get to a correct face uh, despite incorrect starting positions, perturbations, 
And uh, the, how, so, so of course, this raises the important question, how does it know what a correct face looks like? How does it know which region in that face it should be navigating towards? And I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes with respect to a kind of bioelectric pattern memory. But uh, this, this, this ability of tissues to, to create uh, what, uh, what, what, what is going to be an adaptive anatomy goes, goes further than, than simple remodeling like this. This is, a, uh, this is an example of um, uh, it just an amazing uh, metamorphosis. So, so this is a caterpillar. So these have brains that are suitable for driving this kind of thing that crawls in two dimensions and it chews leaves. But it has to turn into this, which is a creature that flies, uh, navigating three dimensions, and it drinks nectar, completely different behavioral repertoire. So during this, uh, during this um, uh, time of, of remodeling, uh, the brain is basically liquefied. Uh, most of the connections are broken down. Most of the cells are killed off. And yet the memories remain. So it's been shown now that if you train a caterpillar, the butterflies and moths remember the original information. So you can think about a very kind of uh, uh, basic philosophical problem on steroids, which is never mind what it's like to be a caterpillar or a butterfly. What's it like to be a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, right? To be an agent that, that, whose, whose uh, cognitive substrate is being actively remodeled during the lifetime of that agent. Um, in fact, we can make novel configurations that are, uh, that are completely adaptive. So, so this is again, is a tadpole. You will notice that instead of the eyes here, it has an eye on its tail. And what we found is that even though this brain evolved for millions of years to expect visual input from exactly these locations, if you put an eye on its tail, no problem. The eye, the eye forms, even though it's next to muscle instead of brain, it makes an optic nerve. The optic nerve lo looks around and may connect to the spinal cord instead of to the brain. The brain collects that information, how it knows that th this weird um, patch of tissue on its tail is actually providing visual data. We have no idea, but these animals can see perfectly well out of that eye. In other words, we built a machine that trains these animals for visual cues and they can, they can, uh, they can behave uh, quite well. So, so the plasticity of, of major architectural change okay, is, uh, is, is, is really remarkable. That, so, so we're starting to think about the creativity of this process. It's intelligent not only because it can get to the same position of the space from different starting positions. This is William James's definition of intelligence, right? The ability to reach the same goal by different means. But it actually has the ability to handle completely novel configurations. And so what we have in biology at all scales is a kind of competency. This is a multi-scale competency architecture where every layer solves problems. So every layer from your genetic networks to your, um, to your individual cells, net, um, the networks that they make, the different organs, uh, the animals, of course, and the, even the swarms uh, solve various kinds of problems in their own space. Now, what does that look like? Well, here are a few examples. So this is a, uh, it's a, it's a Mexican salamander known as an axolotl. These animals uh, regenerate their limbs. Uh, they, they do a natural experiment to when they're housed together, they bite each other's legs off all the time. They regenerate their legs, they regenerate their tails, uh, we mean including spinal cord, their eyes, their jaws, uh, portions of the heart and the brain. And so what happens is that if, if, uh, if an axolotl loses a limb at any position, what will happen is that it will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less. And then the most magical thing happens, which is that it stops. How does it know when to stop? It stops when a correct salamander limb is complete. So once again, we meet this idea that these, these bodies are navigating the space of anatomies, this morphospace, uh, with a very particular uh, set point about where they're trying to get to. Okay, And one of the things that we've done recently is actually, uh, we, we've actually understood something about where this information is stored. And it is stored bioelectrically. It is stored using electrical uh, memory, basically the same thing that happens in the brain. In fact, we think that brains probably uh, co-opted this ability for much, for much earlier evolutionary contexts. And here, what you can see is that this is, this is one of our favorite examples. This is a planarian, a flatworm. It has a head with a brain and a, a, a central nerve cords and a tail. And the thing about planaria is that they always regenerate. So you can cut them into pieces and every piece will give rise to a perfect little worm. So normally here, this is one, one planaria and you cut off the head and the tail. That middle fragment right here uh, knows exactly what to do. It regrows. And so it makes one head, one tail in the correct positions. No problem. Every piece of the, it's kind of a holographic thing. Every piece of the worm knows exactly what it's supposed to look like. And so we ask the question, how does it know first, how does it know how many heads it's supposed to have? And it turns out that if you, if you read the electrical pattern in this tissue, you can read out something like this that actually says one head, one head, one tail. And that's what it makes. So we went in and using 
a particular technique using drugs that target ion channel uh, pro uh, proteins, we change the bioelectric pattern in this animal. Again, it's a one-headed animal, and we, we simply change the electric pattern that specifies what it remembers a correct planarian to look like. Okay, so when you do that, uh, well, first, nothing happens until you injure it. Once you injure it, it regenerates and uses this information as the template, and then it will go ahead and regenerate exactly what the pattern memory says. And if it says two heads, then it will go ahead and build a two-headed animal. This is not Photoshop. This is not, um, you know, a drawing. These are real. These are real animals. I'll show you a video of them shortly. And so, whether you have one head or two heads is actually not nailed down by the genetics. We don't touch the genome. This is not uh, genomic editing. The genome is completely wild type. If you sequence the genome of these two-headed guys, you will see absolutely nothing wrong. They have a completely normal genetic set of instructions. But the memory of this um, collective intelligence of these cells, when it has to decide how is it going to navigate that space, that memory is stored electrically, much like our memories of experience in three-dimensional space. Now, one thing you can do is you can map out the, the in fact, it was, as Josh was saying, the, the space, you can actually map out the space of this electrical circuit, and you will find regions that correspond to two heads, one heads, or in fact, no heads. Now, one thing, one thing that's kind of uh, unusual here is that there's actually pretty few dimensions here. Why is that? I mean, uh, Josh was pointing out that, that the dimensionality of these spaces grows unbelievably fast, right? So in the Library of Babel, uh, you know, you, you would never find anything. How is it that this is such a low dimensional space in which we can actually find the triggers that turn you into a one-headed, a two-headed, and, and so on? The reason that it's low dimensional is because this we're dealing here with an agential material that is fairly smart. We are not trying to micromanage the position of all the stem cells and all the gene expression. If we were to do that, you would be facing a um, uh, a space that's of the kind that Josh described, which would be intractable both for, for uh, evolution to get to in the rapid uh, way that we see, and also uh, for, for regenerative medicine, for, for bioengineering. The reason that we can, we can take advantage of these nice uh, convenient spaces is because all the components have innate uh, cap uh, competency to read these electrical states and make decisions such as, I'm going to build a head or I'm going to build a tail. These things are, are modular. They have, they have mo a modular structure that, that enables them to do this. Now, not only can we call up different numbers of heads, but it turns out that if you look further in that space, you can find attractors that belong in other to, that belong to other species of planaria. So, so here a triangular uh, planarian can give rise to a flat-headed species like a P. felina, or a round head like an S. mediterranea. Um, in fact, not only uh, do their head shapes change, but their brain shapes and the distribution of stem cells change as well. Again, no genetic change. There's nothing wrong with, genetically with these guys, but they are now using a different region of the space of all possible planarian heads. In fact, we can go even further and really get creative and ask, well, what else is in that space? Well, it turns out that there are things that don't look like planaria at all. So there are spiky forms like this. There are cylinders. There are sort of uh, combination forms. And this, uh, this, the collective intelligence of these cells can explore the regions of that state space. Normally, it's incredibly reliable, and it always gets to where it goes. But we can manipulate that, and 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 using those kinds of signals by manipulating the um, bioelectric information processing in that uh, in that system, we can we can we can start to explore that space. And so now we make the connection to uh, to the xenobots. One thing that we can ask is, well. Presumably, the kinds of shapes that exist in that space were created by evolution. Evolution uh, 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 structures that space to have um, adaptive kinds of animal behaviors and, and animal structures and so on. But the question is really, uh, how, much, how much novelty can we, uh, can we expect from cells as they navigate that space? Where do target morphologies come from? And so what we sought to do was, uh, in, in collaboration with, uh, with, with Josh's lab, is to ask, what happens when cells are liberated from their normal environment and asked to reboot their multicellularity? What, what, are, what are they going to do? So, so this, is, this is what we did. Uh, we took um, skin cells from an, early, from an early frog embryo. We cultured them in a dish. Now, there are many things they could have done. They could have died. They could have crawled away from each other and spread out. They could have made a two-dimensional monolayer like cell culture. Instead, they did this. So here are the cells being loaded into this little, they're dissociated, they're being, remember, this is just skin. They're being, um, overnight, they, they basically collapse together into this, they, they cohere into this little little ball. Um, the flashes that you're seeing are calcium signaling, meaning it's, it's um, they're processing information is extremely brain-like, actually. And then, and then you get this. So this is the xenobots that Josh introduced you to. So they're using these little hairs that normally would be spreading the mucus around on the, on the surface of the frog. 
uh, or the or the tadpole. So it swims along. They can have all kinds of behaviors. They can go in circles. They can patrol back and forth. They can have collective behaviors like this. Here's here's a xenobot um, navigating a maze. There's no water flow. The water is completely still. So here it goes. It takes the corner without bumping into the outside wall. And at this point, for whatever reason, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. Okay, so they have spontaneous behaviors that we are not uh, micromanaging. You can see with these calcium signals, if you were to take a, a reading of um, of a uh, of a of a of a brain, human, zebrafish, whatever, this is what you would see. You would see you would see this kind of calcium spiking. And so remember, there's no neurons here. We're still uh, working to decode what these cells are saying to each other and what the bots may be saying to themselves. They regenerate. So if you cut uh, if you cut the, uh, the the bot in half, they will actually seal up. So here you go. They'll seal up just like that. And uh, and of course, as Josh showed you, the, one, one of the most amazing things they do is um, they actually uh, they actually make copies of themselves. So this is kinematic replication. I mean, think of think of what's happened here. Um, we've made it impossible for these cells to reproduce in the way that frogs normally reproduce. Within 48 hours, they find a new way to make copies of themselves out of stuff they find in their environment in a way that, as far as we know, no other animal does, right? So talk about creativity, novelty. This is, this is a completely new way that they're, that they're doing to, to, uh, to make copies of themselves. But the only reason it works is because it, it, what we're dealing with is an agential material. These cells the reason we can make xenobots is because once you put once you would take the cells uh, and put them in a particular configuration, they want to get together and and become a uh, and become a xenobot. That is exactly what allows the second generation because all of these all that these guys do is they make the little piles and then the little piles turn into more xenobots. And this is exactly what makes evolution so efficient is that it's working with an agential material. It's not working with a passive kind of a material. These, these cells already have agendas. They used to be single cell organisms. They have all kinds of uh, control circuits about what they should do in uh, under various circumstances. And we as engineers and evolution can take advantage of that. And so um, the, the amazing thing, of course, is that both of these life histories have exactly the same genome. So this is the standard one. And if, you know, the thing about development is that it's so reliable, it basically lulls us into this false sense of um, uh, determinism where we think that, well, if, 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 you know, frogs, frog eggs make frogs and uh, acorns make oak trees, what else would it be? But it turns out that that's just one possible way uh, to live. Here's here's another one. The exact same cells um, can um, can form can form a xenobot. It has a developmental sequence. So two months later, it looks like this. I have no idea what this is. This is a completely new developmental stage that's never existed um, before, and uh, and they have a, and they have different behaviors than tadpoles do. So so now we have uh, the answer to a couple of questions. The first question is. Um, what, what do skin cells really want to do? Looking at an embryo, you might think that, well, what they'd like to do is to have this uh, boring sort of passive two-dimensional life on the outside of the animal, keeping out the bacteria. And then you find out that that's actually not their default behavior. That's their behavior when they are basically bullied into it by the instructive interactions by the rest of the cells. So what evolution is really doing is enabling other cells to have this kind of uh, behavior shaping effect where it takes these, these competent skin cells and shapes their behavior to be an outer skin surface. In the absence of all of that, this is their native behavior. This is actually what, what the skin cells do uh, baseline. And of course, then when, when you ask the question, well, where does this come from? Uh, unlike every other creature on earth where, well, it's the explanation is it's eons of selective pressure to be this shape or this, co this color or to have this behavior. There's never been any xenobots. So there's never been specific uh, evolutionary pressure to be a good xenobot. The typical story you would tell about any other life on Earth doesn't exist here. And so, and yet, and yet, overnight they make a very coherent organism. So where does that come from? This is one of the biggest uh, mysteries uh, facing facing us today. So I just want to close up by saying that um, because life is so incredibly interoperable and because cells have to solve these problems on the fly, they don't take too seriously the expectations of prior um, develop, um, uh, evolutionary lineages. They, 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 can, they can do a lot of things on the fly. That, that makes them incredibly interoperable, which means that almost any combination of evolved material, so the cells, tissues, DNA, whatever is natural, with designed material, so smart, uh, various smart materials, um, nanotechnology, and so on, and software, almost any combination of this stuff is some kind of coherent agent that's going to have some sort of body, and it's going to have some sort of cognitive capacity, maybe very, maybe very simple, maybe quite advanced. And so already we have hybrids and, and cyborgs and, and humans plugged into various things. We are going to be living in, a, uh, in an incredibly large 
um, uh, option space of possible living agents. Everything that's that we're familiar with in the biological world is like this tiny corner of that. And this has this has real implications for uh, developing better uh, better frameworks for how we relate to other creatures that are profoundly different from us. Not just in the way that Darwin thought of, meaning just distance along that same you know linear distance along that same um, tree of life, but completely different uh, types of creatures that are nowhere on the um, on the tree of life. So um, uh, I will close here to, and just to say that there are more, um, more in-depth discussions and some things that Josh and I um, have written. And uh, I want to thank uh, the couple of people that did the work. So, so Doug, Doug Blackiston is the biologist that did all the Xenobot stuff. Sam Kriegman is uh, Josh's PhD student that did all the uh, computer science for, for all of this and um, various collaborators and our funders. And I'm here if you're wondering what um, two-headed planaria do in their spare time, this is it. Uh, they've been called impossible objects because when you cut two-headed worms, it's a, it's a memory. And of course, memory persists. They, pieces of a two-headed worm continue to make two-headed worms. Okay, and with, with despite their their normal genetics, it's a permanent line that's got a completely different morphology. So um, uh, yeah, and that's it. And and thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks a lot. Super fantastic talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, I ask questions immediately from the audience. If someone has a burning question in the in the hand. No? Um, I have here several, I just don't know which, where to start. Um, some of them are smaller. Um, one of the questions I wrote down here, which is actually for both of you, uh, limitations. What are the limitations, or, or I guess kind of referencing, um, how, how did you come up with this idea what what's the next step and what are the challenges and limitations on this because i see some but i'm curious to hear from you i, I can speak to some of the technological challenges and opportunities here the, the first one is that the ai is able to generate so many ideas of things to try and it and it's relatively certain that they're going to work given the biology that it has is that our, I think our ability to manufacture and test these ideas in reality is log, lagging far behind. So one challenge that Mike and I are working on is how to, how to ensure that the manufacturing or the ability to build these things, bring them into reality, uh, can keep up with what the AI can dream up. Mike? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go in a slightly different direction and say that I think the biggest limitation is the limitation of our imagination in the following sense. All of the engineering in the past has been uh, largely focused on passive materials where you have to be responsible for everything that the material is going to do. And we now have to shift to a completely different mode of engineering that is much more of a collaboration with the material. It's more about communicating uh, and, and um, behavior shaping the material at, at, at various levels of, of, of competency and giving it various signals to try and convince it to do things it already knows how to do, perhaps in new ways and ways that other to achieve other, other things that you want it to achieve. It is a completely different way of engineering. It is, uh, it is something that is, 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 requires a major revolution, not only in, in engineering, but in, for example, regenerative medicine, where, uh, so, so we work on things like trying to grow, uh, grow back people's limbs and regenerate organs. And, and I don't believe that's going to happen by, by micromanaging where all the cells go and what all the gene expressions are. I think we're much more likely to achieve that by taking seriously the competency of the material and communicating to the, to the tissues, this is the shape we want. Now go ahead and go ahead and build it. So, so to, to me, that's the biggest limitation is, is building conceptual frameworks that allow you to take the intelligence of your material seriously and take advantage of, of what it can do. Uh, thank you, Michael and Josh. You have a question in the chat. I'm going to read it. Uh, this is perhaps more of a comment than a question, but um, <clears throat> the adaptable and predictable behavior of the Xenobots has some nice parallels with the first speaker's question about unruliness and the idea of um, that lives uh, preserves. Given that, as you mentioned, evolution programs sense to act in ways that they don't necessarily want. Uh, I would be curious to hear your thoughts about the concept of unruliness and um, how that relates to creativity in the context of life building. 
I mean, what I would say is that uh, we have to remember that it, a lot of the important aspects of all of this are observer dependent. So when we as an observer, as let's say the engineer uh, looks at these kind of systems and we make claims about this is how intelligent I think they are, this is the range of problems they know how to solve, they are unruly because, because, I, because I don't know the rules or they are ruly because I've come up with some rules that seem to fit. All of this is uh, provisional and uh, it's, we, we are basically ourselves taking an IQ test when we make claims about these things. And uh, other observers uh, it may, may be much cleverer than, than we are and test them in different spaces. So for example, in, in physical space, this is what they know how to do. But like bacteria in physiological space or metabolic space, they may have enormous competencies that, that we may have absolutely no idea about. So whether something, and, and then of course, many systems are, make models internally of themselves and of the outside world. And so how they see themselves is a complete is, is a whole other question. So so whether or not something is ruly or 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 unruly is re always relative to an observer, I think. And uh, almost certainly we're going to find these things to be unruly because we're not actually very good at at predicting what collective intelligences are going to do. So I think it's very likely that we find all these things unruly because we just we just don't have a good a good um, science yet or even good intuitions yet about how to predict what the rules ought to be. I, I'd uh, add on to Mike here again this idea of, of what does it mean to be unruly or ruly. I, I think you know it's interesting the language that the previous speaker used and and the message in chat here. You know the cells don't want it, the tissues don't want it. You know what, what do they or don't they want? One of the things that we can do with our AI technologies is not ask them to make useful machines, but ask them to make machines that are conceptually transparent, that they create living systems that allow us to see better what the what the cells and tissues, quote unquote, do and don't want to do. Um, another angle to this is uh, is comparing it with robotics. So somewhat tongue in cheek, this technology is now referred to as xenobots or biobots. A, a robot is, you know, a machine that's designed by humans or these days an AI to do something useful for humans. I've been combining AI and robotics for 20 years. And traditionally with robotics, the AI has to figure out how to build a machine using a battery, some hunks of metal, ceramics, plastics, circuitry, sensors, motors. And most of the time, it, the AI really struggles. Those are dead materials that don't collaborate in this creative process of trying to make something more than the sum of their parts. The, the one thing that I've learned with my through my collaboration with Mike's group in doing this, building machines out of living systems is that they're collaborative. And again, that's my view on it. It seems that they seem to somehow collaborate in this process. It's, it's, it doesn't seem to me that they're resisting. They're somehow going along with what it is we want them to do. And again, there's a lot of anthropomorphizing there and taking an intentional stance. The only thing I know for sure is it's very, very different from building machines out of dead or inorganic materials. And like Mike said, I think that's a harbinger of a complete sea change in the way that we think about, you know, art, creativity, engineering, basically making stuff. It's gonna be very, very different in the years to come. Thanks. Um, there's a question here from Iona, I think. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I uh, very much enjoyed your uh, presentation. And um, yeah, you used uh, a lot of language um, that I relate and some and a lot of anthropomorphizing, yeah, uh, which we artists tend to do on a daily basis and encourage to do, but I know scientists are trying to avoid. So that was a, a very interesting uh, aspect as well. Um, I also enjoyed the fact that you looked at life not from um, a genetic perspective, but actually, um, you know, you, you opened up the black box to have um, a more kind of um, a genteel cellular uh, material. So um, just going back to language, it, ah, okay, first of all, I want to ask if xenobots themselves have their own kind of uniqueness or are they more or less the same? That's one question. Like, can you see, um, you know, if we are going all the way to anthropomorphizing those xenobots, I mean, we're talking, I think Josh, you talked about them as like almost um, 
babies, um, do they have their own personalities? That's one question that I have. Um, another thing is that the language of uh, liberating is quite interesting. You, yeah, I mean, you really, yeah, and again, language is not neutral. <laughs> so when you say you're liberating the cells, you are um, taking a standpoint. And I think that was the question. How much do you think um, you're liberating them or how much, you know, you're displacing them? That's one question that I have to say. Saying all that, I displace cells on a daily basis. So that's fine. Um, Another thing that I want to say, to say is that you use Rene Descartes as the um, person of intelligence, but Rene Descartes made a complete uh, um, division between body and mind. And I think what you're trying to say here, that there's not such a division, that actually intelligence is already, whatever intelligence is, you know, we're using those big words, um, is already in the cell you know, and definitely a combination of cells. So that was another thing that is quite interesting. Maybe we need to think about a new philosopher to put there. Um, and yeah, um, I, I enjoyed it very much because of this, um, create, uh, you know, anthropocentric uh, language that we're using, collaboration. Um, I think the cells collaborate probably more with each other than with you, but that's fine. And, <laughs> and again, I've been collaborating with cells a lot and not all collaboration were, um, yeah, so successful, but very interesting. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. A uh, lot, lots of good things to talk about. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we take the language very seriously and we think about it quite, quite a lot actually. And, uh, the reason the, uh, the, well, the specific reason I show Rene Descartes as that example is exactly because you can see that a process that goes extremely gradually and slowly from a single cell, in fact, from a quiescent uh, oocyte, can give rise to a kind of system that's going to then make uh, pronouncements like, hey, I'm not a machine, right? I'm not a, you know, uh, I'm something different and so on. I mean, it's amazing, actually, that that uh, that process can give rise to uh, 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 beings that that have a cognitive capacity to make claims, uh, you know, that are completely at odds with with the actual process that gave rise to them, right? So that's to to me, I did that, I do that, I show Descartes on purpose because I think that's quite interesting. Um, I, I will also say this about anthropomorphizing. Uh, I, I I I don't believe there's any such thing for the following reason. I think I think that whole that whole um, uh, what they call that, that whole uh, supposed fallacy of anthropomorphizing things is a holdover from pre-scientific worldviews where uh, there was a, a, a sort of Garden of Eden and there were a bunch of uh, fixed uh, kinds of organisms and there was there was Adam and he was a human and there was a bunch of other animals and it was very important to be sure not to um, not to uh, say anything that made it sound like the kinds of things that Adam can do are in some small way possible outside of, uh, of, of, of the human species. That, that, that humans had some sort of, you know, when we say something is anthropomorphized, we're saying that there's, there's some kind of unique magic here that we shouldn't even look for it in, in even tiny versions, basal versions anywhere else. But the one thing we now know from evolution and, and in particular from development, it's slow and gradual. There is, there is no magic time point at which a lightning bolt uh, sort of gives uh, a true cognition or true memory or, 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 or a goal directedness or anything else. You, you start off as, as, as a piece of physics, which most people would say, okay, you, you know, you shouldn't anthropomorphize or whatever. And nine months later, and uh, you know, maybe a couple of years later, you say, okay, now, now we can anthropomorphize it. Nothing magical happens during that time. Literally, it's, it's slow and gradual step by step. And so, you know, I, I push very strongly on this idea that, that there is not a binary distinction between uh, any of these things. There's, it's, it's gradual, and the question is what kind and how much. So we can ask questions about, um, for any given system, it could be a, an amoeba, it could be a xenobot, it could be a plant, it could be a new, you know, synthetic alien life form, whatever. For any of these things, the real question is, okay, what kind of cognitive capacity does it have? And, and there are good frameworks worked out that are that are that actually show you all the, all the different steps along the way. 
and how much, you know, how much should we treat it uh, as a cognitive agent, not binary, but what kind and how much. So all, all the language is actually is, is used here quite, quite intentionally to try to break down that um, what, what, what I think is a false dichotomy. I, I would just add to that again, the, the robotics and AI perspective here that going all the way back to the cyberneticians in the, in the 50s and into the 40s, a lot of them uh, intentionally used agential language. They would point to, you know, the machine of the day and say it's thinking, it wants, it's trying to, and and a lot of that was a, a prod against our preconceptions about what is and it does, what has and what does not have agency. And today, if you look at robotics and AI, these are two branches of cognitive science, essentially that focus on the body and the brain, robotics and AI. So Cartesian dualism is still with us and it's deeply you know, marred the way we think about intelligence uh, in machines. And so you can see in our field today, and my colleagues, you know, they feel very confident to point at GPT-3, the current state of the art in AI and say, it's not conscious. It, it has no thoughts, it's not creative, it's not an artist, it's different from human artists. Whether they're right or not, the, the telling sign that's been true ever since the cyberneticians is this confidence that we know this machine absolutely has no agency, humans absolutely have agency, animals absolutely have slightly less than us. And it's interesting, I think, from an artistic point of view and, and from an engineering and scientific point of view to probe the origins of that certainty. Why are we so certain? And as you know, as technology and science continues, is to observe how it's dissolving that certainty. I am completely um, agreeing with you that we shouldn't be the binary in its continuum. And you know, actually, all those kind of projects that discussed here raising all those questions, which are you know um, um, interesting and and if I may say, even magical. Um, my question, and then I'll stop and let other talk to you. <laughs> so uh, just to be, again, and I'm um, a provocateur here, okay? Don't, uh, part of being an artist is to be a provocateur. And many, uh, in many respects, you know, I agree, but I provoke. So first of all, for Josh, so do you think that AI has agency at the moment? Like when you work with AI, do you have a agency? And for um, Michael, can you see life evolve from non-living material? Great questions. And I, I also wanted to say I loved your talk. I, I learned a lot. And clearly, you know, you've been in the trenches for many, many years. You know the challenges and, and, and the joys of creating with living materials. I would say I don't know. I don't know how to know. I don't know how to know whether the AI has agency or not. I feel equal, equally uncomfortable if I claim that it does or it doesn't. And so, you know, following in Turing's footsteps, I, I see that in this case, when we think about AI generated biology, the, the products of what our AI dreams up, we can point to those as a form of Turing test. There's, there's a creative product. There is someone or something that created this thing, this Xenobot, that has never existed on Earth before. And if you claim that the AI is not creative, it's not an artist, it doesn't have agency, then the onus falls back onto you to prove that human artists have agency, have creativity, have inspiration. And if you're clear that one type of artist is different from the other, tell me how they're different. So again, I think I agree with you. I think, you know, Mike and I and you and everyone here are provocateurs. And there's one thing that's pretty pr provoking is the things that this AI spits out. And it just helps us, you know, really get at the roots of why we're often so certain about what is and isn't agential. Yeah, um, I, I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, with respect to, to life and uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure that that life is a super interesting criterion, honestly. I think that uh, cognitive capacity is much more interesting because there are many things on the spectrum of agency, um, and we, we could do a whole, a whole kind of discussion about w what's on that spectrum, but, but there are many things on that spectrum that nobody would, uh, would call alive. There are many things that people would agree are alive, and there are many things that uh, we would argue about and never reach a consensus. And so when I see uh, disagreements about a terminology that are not uh, reachable by experiment and that are basically just sort of people argue in, in, in endlessly with about these philosophical pre um, kind of uh, preconceptions to me that sounds like that 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 always feels like a pseudo problem that that means our terminology isn't good so so i don't know that life by itself is a particularly interesting um, concept but i do really like uh trying to figure out where things fall on a particular uh, spectrum of, of of agency and to go back to the other question of of, of uh, kind of engineered agency and AI and so on, you know, the the, the best um, kind of roadmap to all this was given to us by science fiction, uh, you know, probably well over 100 years ago, you can just run this mental experiment. So you're at home one day, this thing lands on your front lawn, something trundles out, uh, it, it uh, you know, you come out to, to look at it. it, it sort of hands you this, this poem that it wrote along the way about how happy it is to meet you. And so now you have some choices to make because it doesn't look like anything you've seen before. There are no obvious things. Well, it kind of looks like a fish, so I'm going to treat it like a fish. Um, it doesn't look like anything you've seen before. You could try to use these old categories that we had. So you sort of, what, what did you do in the old days to find out? You would sort of knock on it. And if you hear a kind of metallic clanging sound, you would make conclusions. You would say, okay, it came out of a factory. It's going to be boring and, um, and, and kind of simplistic. And I'm, you know, ethically, it's permissible for me to take it apart and, and you know, do some things with it. We, we, you can't do that anymore, right? And once you understand that, that there's this space of, of, of possible beings, those criteria fail utterly. It doesn't matter what it's made of. The fact that it might be largely aluminum, that doesn't matter for any of the things we care about. Um, you might ask where it came, you know, how did it come to be? Was it created by some other intelligence? Like, a, is, this, is this the quote unquote robot that somebody built or is this the actual alien civilization that sent it? Does that even matter once that once, you know, it's, it gives you some pretty good poetry and you feel like you can have some kind of a relationship to it? All of the criteria, it's like Josh said, uh, you know, we can't tell anymore because all that we now see that the criteria that we've been using are kind of uh, kind of uh, useless, and and really we're just just based on on limitations of imagination and technology in the previous age. And even though we don't have yet aliens, you know, real exobiological aliens, what we do have are created um, constructs, whether they be software or whether they be xenobots or whatever else. That are basically filling that role. So all the problems that 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 the science fiction writers talked about about how do you relate to something that's completely alien? How are you going to know whether you owe it respect or whether you can take it apart and do things? All all of these things are now with us today, even though the aliens haven't landed because we these aliens are here now. We can make them. So all of those problems are here, and we do not yet have a good roadmap for making any decisions like that. Thanks. Um, questions from audience. Nobody dares to ask anything, but I have a question. No, at first, I have a comment. I was thinking, thanks, Michael, because I was thinking exactly this, that the terminology somehow doesn't match because this kind of two-headed worm, I mean, that would be called mutation earlier. But mutation then also, or, or so, I, in my head, it would reference something which is a, a chance evolution. But this is intentional in some sense. I don't know. Uh, and, 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 also, and also, it's not a mutation because, because mutations are supposed to be changes to the genetic material. Ex ah, the genetic that is material. true. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that there isn't really a term for that, what it is. Uh, well, there are plenty of terms for it in neuroscience because in neuroscience, we have a, we have a great body of knowledge about how uh, information about goals in various spaces are stored in electrical networks. So people who study memory, learning, and things like this, they face exactly this problem. There's a rat. The rat has remembered how to run the maze from beginning to end. And so our job is to do some kind of neural decoding because we believe that that information, the goal, the cognitive content 
of that rat's mind is in some way in the electrical network, right? So, so neuroscientists already grapple with this. With this, you, they have a they have a physical machine that in some way embodies mental goals. I mean, it's an it's an amazing thing. But 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 neuroscientists already face this. And and what I'm saying is that brains did not evolve that magic trick. It basically they just optimized it for, from other types of spaces that evolution has been dealing with for 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 a really long time. Yeah. Another question to Charles, or kind of a, I guess, um, it, what I'm wondering with AI is that AI is always kind of, I, I feel it's always based on human limitations. It's a kind of modeling based on us. What do you think, it, like, I guess my, my concern here would be that that's a sort of a, the limitation of, of this development, but what's your take on it? Or can you see that it can go further? Yeah, it's a great question. So historically, AI is, is built built in human form. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that there are three players here that are of interest, the humans, the living, living systems, and the AI itself. Mike just mentioned aliens. You know, what's which one is the alien here? The, the AI is also alien in a certain way. The, the AI that I, I focus on is these evolutionary algorithms, which I would say are, are nothing like human beings. They are literally Darwinian selection operating inside a machine. They are amoral. They don't care. They have no value judgments of what they find. Um, and that's just, it's a fact. That, that's what it is. Now, what we as a society want to do with that, I think, uh, Ionat spoke eloquently to that in, in her talk. It's, it's value neutral. You know, th this AI is going to bring back things from, you know, morpho space, robo space, biobot space, you know, cultured meat space. It's going to bring back things that are increasingly troubling. They may solve a lot of our problems in ways that we don't necessarily like. That's one of the, the, the more recent lessons from AI is that AI knows how to build autonomous, uh, autonomous cars. And those autonomous cars kill less human beings than human driven cars. Full stop. What, what is it that we want to do about that? We can't decide. Different countries have different ideas about how they want to regulate that technology. Th that is going to be our biggest challenge. Not that the AI is not, you know, is too much like humans and is going to come up with the same things we do. The challenging part is going to come up with very, very different things and force us to make moral decisions that I think are very difficult because it's gonna bring back solutions that are increase, incredibly efficacious. They're gonna help relieve, alleviate a lot of biomedical suffering as, as Mike would, will tell you, but they are troubling in other ways. They are very alien solutions that maybe we would not have thought of or not necessarily digestible. And I, I, I don't have an answer about how we're going to regulate, you know, think through the solutions that the AI presents us with. I would argue it, it's the alien. It's it's got very different values than we do. No one, yeah, um, no one talks about the biases of AI. I mean, uh, yet yeah, I just wonder if you heard about AI biases. Would you like to ask um, about that? <laughs> yes. Okay, yes, they would like to ask about that. We have a scientist in the room who's been studying biases in AI, <clears throat> particularly natural language processing, and I would ask her to talk about that, but uh, I'm actually very concerned, a little bit concerned about the ethical dilemmas. I know, Michael, that you had put ethics as a side note in one of your slides, but how do we really confront this uh, increasingly, we have done this in the context of GMO products. We've had to think about regulatory frameworks for that. But increasingly, as we build more of these kinds of uh, biological machines, uh, they may have an impact on an environment that is unintended. And uh, a, a scientist's discovery innovation is super important, but in the hands of perhaps other actors, uh, it may take a different role. So at what point, sort of like CIFR and all the other technologies, gene slicing, when do we make a decision about trying to also develop ethical frameworks around this work? And maybe I'll ask Rochelle if she has a question about bias. <laughs> not, at not, not at the moment. Yeah, the, 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 the question, uh, the, the answer to um, wh when do we develop ethical frameworks for all this is, is like 100 years ago, that that's when we should have done it. Because, because many, many issues 
Uh, I mean, look at, you know, we, we don't have to uh, think about uh, xenobots in particular. We can think about all of the things that we've done when we domesticate various animals. We've been making chimeras for thousands of years. You know, mules don't exist naturally, right? It's a, it's a chimeric creation. Um, we have a food industry that, that treats uh, pigs and, uh, and sheep and cows, which are, you know, animals which are probably not controversially agential in certain ways. Uh, this stuff has been with us for a really long time. All, all this new technology is doing is really just shining a spotlight on the fact that we do not have a proper framework for dealing with uh, other, other, uh, other agents. You know, for asking whether they look like humans sufficiently is not cutting it. And, and we should have known that for a long time. And we've been, some people have been wrestling with that for a long time, but now it's just blazingly obvious and we need to do this. Now, the other thing I'll point out about the environmental and everything else is, Look, there's a there's and, and we spend a lot of time thinking about these issues. There's a there's a common stance from which people come at this, which is kind of this background assumption that, OK, everything is pretty good now and we need to make sure that the scientists don't screw it up. Right. There's a hundred different ways that, you know, people who work with viruses, with bacteria, with really scary things could could really mess up the world in a in a in a big way. And um, that that's kind of a general feeling that everything's great. And just let's just make sure we don't make things worse. I think this is this is a, a, a fundamentally, again, a holdover from like a, a kind of Garden of Eden view where we where people used to think that the world that 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 the that, that our environment and the world was created in some sort of optimal fashion. And now it's on us not to make things worse. I just want to point out that that evolution does not optimize for intelligence, for happiness, for any of the things we value. It optimizes for biomass. That's it. And so that means that um, we have to take seriously the fact that things are not great right now. There is unbelievable human and animal suffering worldwide, biomedical suffering. Uh, there are major environmental problems. Um, all of these things already exist. So, so the question isn't how do we sort of clamp down on scientific progress so that we don't we don't make things worse. The, the, the to me the point is we all as 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 scientists as artists as philosophers all all of these communities have an ethical duty an actual moral responsibility to figure out what technologies are available to make life better for everybody for every for for all sentient beings basically and that does not include keeping status quo and hoping that somebody doesn't develop something that that screws it up it it means taking very seriously the fact that uh we are now collaborators with this material and at least uh at least we have some ability it's not great but we have some ability to, uh, to engineer things toward a particular purpose. And that gives us massive responsibilities. And, and that means more science, not less science. And so that, that's how I come at this is that, is that we, have, we, have this we have a responsibility now to understand what's going on when collections of parts become new emergent agents. We used to, you know, Dan, Dan Dennett had this, this phrase, um, uh, uh, competency without comprehension. We, we've been making, think about this, humans have been making extremely intelligent uh, uh, highly agential beings with no idea of how they do it or what's going to happen next. It's called having children, right? We've been doing this forever. We create these, these unbelievably um, competent uh, uh, kinds of uh, advanced beings, and we're not doing a super great job. You know, if you look around in the society, we're not doing a great job to make sure that everybody's, um, you know, uh, has, a, has, a, has a good experience in, in the world. And uh, this is just a tiny microcosm of that. It's just shining a spotlight on this idea that we are now doing it with comprehension, whereas before we were just kind of doing it. So now, now we really have to understand what it is that we're doing and how we're going to shape all this towards a, a better life for sentient beings on the planet. Thank you. Any other questions? And thanks for the, for the last, Michael. I have to say that yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we are able to do a better job. I hope so. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, look at how we are reproducing and creating <laughs> what kind of beings on this planet. Yeah, okay, here's Ionot still. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's completely, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't think, yeah. Um, Let's not, yeah, that's another question. I think we have to be a bit more humble uh, about our ability to create a better world. And when you say for everyone, I say, who for, you know, um, we are very privileged people, the three of us. Um, and it's probably because of certain things. But anyway, uh, my question is more um, about evolution. Um, 
I guess we talked about mutation, that mutation, uh, you know, defined as something that is um, by gene happens because of um, genetic um, um, mistake or defect, etc. Evolution, can evolution happen because of morphology and not be because of genetic variant? So, so yes and no, it depends. It, it's, it's a subtle, it's a subtle thing. Um, Evolution is definitely guided by morphology because the morphology of and the behavior of any given creature uh, is uh, is is a strong determinant of what genes are going to pass on to the next generation, right? So if you're reproductively successful, whatever, blah blah blah. So so for, for, for sure, morphology plays a huge role in shaping downstream uh, downstream changes in, in in genetics. But I will also I, I will also emphasize this. Uh, and, and, and xenobots are a great example of that, but there are many other examples. Uh, we, need to, we need to be clear on this, that um, what, evolution, what evolution gives us when it finds a good genome is not a particular creature that is a, a solution to a particular environment and it's fit for that environment and so on. The Xenopus lavis genome is not a recipe for a frog. It is not a solution for how to live in a frog-like environment. It is a recipe for a problem-solving machine which in many different configurations can solve many other problems and do all kinds of other things. The planarian genome is not a recipe for a one-headed worm that does certain things. It is a recipe for building a, a set of tissues that is actually reprogrammable. And if it's experience, bioelectric experience is such that uh, now it, it, it's supposed to have two heads, it will have two heads and it will permanently have two heads forever. Uh, that, that's the interesting thing that we're discovering now about, about evolution is that it makes these competent um, problem-solving uh, agents, which is, which is completely different than simply tracking the frequency of, of genes in, in future generations and, and, and uh, trying to do a direct mapping between the genetics and, and the anatomy. You know, that, there's this incredible layer of competent physiology that sits between the genome and the outcomes. And so, so that's, that, I think, is, is how we need to think about this. Super interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I guess I have a, if nobody else has a question, I have a last question. So, so what's next? Like, what, where is this going? Or do you have a certain kind of projection there to the future? Uh, you talk about the reprogramming, is that sort of uh, what you're doing now? Or is there, what's the aim? Is the life going to come better? Yeah. Um, so, so, so on my side, uh, there's a there's a few key things. Uh, I, I think there are three main um, threads of of positive impact that are going to come from this kind of work, and and not just Xenobots, but but just this work in general. The, the the first and most obvious are useful synthetic living machines. Okay. So so can we make Xenobots? Can we make skin cells do things that uh, that are useful for uh, that 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 improve life for for uh, other creatures of much higher agency us other animals wh whoever so so useful synthetic living machines that's that's one the other big thing that's going to come of this is regenerative medicine because to the extent that we can use these platforms as a kind of sandbox to understand how do collectives of cells make decisions about what to make? That's still very much an open question. And if we understood the answer to that, if we could communicate to these cells what we want them to make, then birth defects, traumatic injury, uh, uh, degenerative disease, even cancer is, are, are basically going to be solved. This is, this is the one fundamental question that underlies most of medicine, not, not infectious disease, but pretty much everything else in medicine. It boils down to how, how do we uh, induce a collection of cells to make the kind of organ that we want. So, so I think uh, we're, we're very actively working on this to use this as a platform of discovery for transformative regenerative medicine, um, which, is, which is not the expensive you know, stem cell implants and all that kind of stuff, but actually very cheap off patent uh, ion channel drugs that uh, could be deployed worldwide, not just uh, not just in certain communities. And then, and then the third thing that that I think is is also next that we really need to d think deeply about is using this using these advances to really push for uh, a, a, a general understanding that that we need new ethical frameworks that 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 old criteria of where you came from, meaning evolved or designed, and what you look like, meaning on the kind of tree of life on earth, that what you look like and where you came from are not a good way to 
determine how we are how we're all going to relate to to this being and i think that goes way beyond the xenobots but but it's just it's just a general push to grow to, to to grow up as a species and get and get much better um much deeper definitions that are not you know these kind of trivial things that have been around for for, for decades so those are those are the three things that are next and, and we're working hard on all of that from the from the ai perspective i would say again come, circling back to to art i think what, what an AI functions increasingly like is a mirror. It holds up a mirror to human beings. And in, what AI is producing and what it does and doesn't do makes it harder and harder for us humans to hide, uh, hide behind our cognitive biases. All humans are flawed. Our society is flawed. I'm a human being, but I'm slightly less flawed than all of you, right? The AI comes back and said, you asked for this. I did exactly what you wanted. I found AI bias. Um, you know, female tends to associate more with nurse and caregiver, male tends to associate more with doctor. That's what is in your every, all human text written since the dawn of time. It's a fact. What are you going to do about it? it? It's able to, I think, reflect, you know, what it means to be human and the flaws of humans in an increasingly acute way. And it's making us all increasingly uncomfortable and how we're going to deal with that, I think that that's what's next. I would say AI bias is actually not, you know, a mistake or a flaw about something to be worried about. I would say it's probably the greatest achievement of AI so far. So mm -hmm. as an artist, I, I would say that's the future for AI is becoming a better and better mirror for, for humans. Thank you. And now I think that we're going to finish this. We will have some drinks here. And I wish you a fantastic day. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you so much. This was very enjoyable. We should yeah, return yeah. you for Thanks. drinks. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Where am I? Here. <laughs>